Hello, golf instructors. My name is Gabriel Ryder, leader of Golf Influencer, and welcome back to the Golf Influencer podcast, where we help golf instructors get launched on YouTube and help grow your influence, impact, and income. This show, we talk about what it means to be a great coach, how to scale your golf instruction online, and how to impact the game of golf. Today's guest is Mr. Andrew Fish Fisher. Fish has spent 10 years on the PGA Tour working for some of the game's greatest players as a physiotherapist, caddy, personal trainer, and performance coach, ending his career working five years for Bubba Watson, one of the most interesting and talented players of our time, helping him get to the number two ranked golfer in the world and win the Masters, the infamous hook around the trees. Fish has also gone on to run one of the most successful golf instructional membership sites with George Genkis, making well over seven figures impacting millions of golfers along the way. So today's episode, we will be talking to Fish about his time, his 10 years on the PGA Tour, and what he's learned from some of the greatest players and coaches, and how other golf instructors can grow on YouTube, scale their golf instruction online, and grow their influence, impact, and income. So without further ado, you've seen him get punched in the stomach by Mark Wahlberg. You've seen him in 94 countries on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. He's a pickleball addict and he's been a part of major championship wins. So that's not easy. Let's give a warm round of applause and welcome to Mr. Andrew Fish. Fisher. <laughs> I have never had an intro like that in my entire life. Well, it is the first episode and they say, you know, the, the, the first one, you got to really do something big out here. Wow. Well, you went big. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Fish, for, for being on our show. Actually, you know, I sent you a screenshot the other day, and we did a podcast. I'm going to put up a screenshot for those that are listening auditorially. October 20th, 2015, and it got some it got some good reviews, Fish. Like, people were liking it. Like, can't wait for more of this podcast. Interesting, insightful. Hey, no, no bull, straightforward. So, Seven years later, Fish, we we've we've listened to the comments and we've responded. <laughs> what is this avatar? You really leave everyone on a cliffhanger. That's right. Well, this is the golf influencer podcast. A whole new thing. Yes, thank you for for being on episode one. It seems fitting to to end with you seven years later to start with you seven years later. And um, so Fish, I want to break this podcast up into two segments. Yeah. First part, I want to talk about your time on the PJ tour because, you know, getting to the PJ tour is already a miraculous feat. spending 10 years there, you know, with the number two ranked golfer in the world, major championship win. I want to talk to you about what you've learned in those arenas. And then I want to talk to you about the, the digital side of things, you know, golf, YouTube, the instructional site with George and how other instructors can take advantage of the opportunity we live in with social media to to grow their golfing brand, to grow their golfing business, and to continue to scale. So to get started, how did you get started in golf, and how did you get started making your way to the PGA Tour? Started in golf. Well, that came uh, at a younger age, probably like 16, and an obsession with my late father, actually, that uh, loved the game and wanted to really have – something to share with his children. So really what it came down to was this incredible ability to be out in nature, have that solace, have a game that constantly challenges you in all aspects and all areas of your mental and emotional states. And it was just really special. And it took me a long time to actually get into golf because it was so hard. I didn't really want to like go down that route. And then I valued hard things later in life. And so 18, 19 is when I really was excited about golf. Um, I graduated college and I was 23 and then decided like, okay, I want to just dedicate my time and my energy and my skill sets to the PGA tour at the highest level. And if I wasn't going to be a player, I could definitely help golfers. Um, that was just such a passion for me. I just, for, for that time period, that's what lit me up. And I had a, just a serendipitous conversation with a guy named like Royce Nielsen. I'll never forget. I sat down at lunch with him and he told me a long story about how he was 
First day on the job, cleaning pools, got lost in Bay Hill area community, and then actually stumbled upon Bay Hill Country Club, um, where Anna Palmer is, where the Anna Palmer Invitational is, and the caddy master was desperately seeking someone to uh, to caddy. And he took the job and he went out there and he had just a blast. He really enjoyed it, quit the pull job. And the very next day he showed up um, at the caddy master stand, waited all day, was thinking this is a huge mistake until Arnold Palmer walked up and he took Arnold Palmer's bag around for 18 holes and ultimately grew a relationship with Arnold and they became uh, a partnership. Um, he was caddy for Arnold Palmer for like six, seven years, flew all over the world, private jets. He gave me this incredible like lifestyle, like meeting kings and queens and just princes and like CEOs, sultans, diplomats, you name it. And the stories that he had just inspired me so much that I couldn't help but move towards that. This is a time period in 2000 and probably four ish, 2003. Social media is not around. I don't know what the world has to offer. I don't know what I want to be. I'm fresh out of college and just speaking with Royce just lit something inside of me that just made me feel something. It made me feel like this was what I had to do. Like more than what I wanted to do. This is something I had to do. And with that, I packed up my car and I drove to Florida with all my belongings, no idea where I was going to be and just actually just showed up at a golf course. And that's how I started my journey within this game and started my uh, inception to the PGA Tour. So it really started out as caddying. He was a caddy and he showcased this like incredible desire to like be inside the ropes and how a lot of times in sports, it's even team sports. If you're not an athlete, you're not in participation within that sport. But caddying gave you an opportunity to be inside the ropes and also be a part of it. And this is right at the time where Tiger and Stevie had this like incredible relationship and they're high five and it made caddying look like it was a dream job. Now, my background essentially is in anatomy and physiology and I love the body and the inner workings of it. And I thought I could play an intermittent like like a role in there, meaning I thought I could actually do both. I could raise the standard of caddy, not just someone who carries a bag and just kind of like gives you numbers and checks wind and maps out the course, but also someone who can show up with nutrition, uh, be a sports psychologist for you, a friend, a confidant, and honestly can be a real partner and a teammate for you. So for me, I thought instead of not having instead of having the skills or let's just say instead of having the experience that most caddies did i thought what a great idea to have skills to replace that experience and so that's what i end up doing i end up building out myself to be kind of one stop shop to help and optimize golfers perform at the highest level that's beautiful and how did you make your way to your first professional golfer <laughs> Yeah, that's a long, uh, <laughs> uh, I just picked up, I actually, um, I was, ca I was caddying at a co course in Tampa called like old Memorial. And I happened to be caddying or happened to be playing with a guy who said he was a caddy on the PGA tour and he worked for Steve Elkington. And I was like, Oh yeah, how did you get there? And he basically said, well, this day and age, no chance you're going to walk inside the PGA Tour and just get a job. Your best bet is at the time something called like the like web.com, the nationwide tour. I think it's the Corn Ferry Tour now. It's gone through a, a number of sponsor changes. But essentially, he's like start at a lower level and start working your way into these relationships with these players. And so that's how it started. I literally, after that 18 holes, I'm, I seem like I'm very impulsive. After that 18 holes, I literally quit told the caddy master I was uh, leaving. I found uh, the internet schedule at a local library where the next event was, and I drove. It was in West Virginia. I drove up there to actually be in my first professional caddy event, and I sat in the caddy uh, tent until actually a player walked up and hired me. Uh, Hank Haney, I think. Or no, um, Nolan Hankey. Nolan Hankey was, um, was the player. And uh, he had won like the BC Open, and it was my first event, and I was like, I'll do it for free. I was very excited. Um, we missed the cut, but it was my first uh, inside the ropes experience and I, I fell in love. Let's talk about 
I want to talk about two words you just said. Yeah. One is impulsive, and the second word is I worked for free. So how important do you think that is for people who are following any dream, whether it's being a great coach, whether it's being a great player, whether it's being a great caddy, and you getting that source of inspiration, that that intuition, you know, hearing about kind of that next step to get you closer to where you want to go. And instead of you being like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I can do it. I, you know, and having all these things, you're like, I, I, I went. And then you weren't worried about what you were going to get from it in terms of a monetary gain. And you're like, hey, I, I'm I'm just so interested and passionate. I'm willing to do this for free. How important do you think are those two angles as you move towards your dream? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's pretty pretty easy to decipher that those are very those are two recipes that you actually need. You need to have experience to know if you love something in life, and so it's going to take some type of impulsion. It's going to take you actually moving into that. It's not going to happen sitting on a couch watching Netflix, it's going to have to be implemented. You have to take it to the world. You have to move your body, your vehicle, and you have to move it into that experience. That's the only way you're actually going to know if you like it or not. So I can fall in love with a story, but it's not real until I actually fall in love with it being my story. And so, and then also the compensation aspect is who am I to charge something? I've never done it before. I need to put in this sweat equity, if you will. I need to actually put in my reps. I want to be good at something. Who doesn't? And that's going to take that opportunity to like be like to get a chance. And I know that I know that money can be a boundary sometimes for people. And I don't think it should be. Life is this beautiful like arrangement. It is this classroom where you get to try things and test this incredible lab. And you know, there's nothing wrong with actually pouring some liquids in here, stirring it around and seeing what kind of chemical reaction happens, not only in life, but like within yourself. How does it make you feel? You know, I think we, we oftentimes have a goal and we see that goal. We're so like adamant about seeing it and like, okay, what does that look like? And that just puts so much pressure on you to try to achieve something that you see because dreams can be big. But it's really about asking yourself like, what? what does my dream feel like? Like if I close my eyes, what does that feel like? Feeling that fully and then working your way towards it. Cause now that is your compass. You can actually always like rely on that. That's always there. And so if you can actually use your feeling as the navigation point to getting there, to feel that more on a consistent basis, I think that's much more applicable. It's like the feelings and how you respond and the resonance to something is like the fuel and the passion that that keeps you going. Mm -hmm. And you like you're saying, you're saying you need to try a lot of different things to feel what really lights you up, what really is a match. Yeah. So obviously, you know, 10 years, you know, and and you know, your preparation before getting to the PG tour, we gotta hit the bullet points. Yeah, of course. What was the next step from, you know, you getting your first, your first gig, you're getting out there, you've, you're getting real world experience with a player that's won. Then how, once again, what was the next step to get to the next level? Yeah, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of hiring and firing, <laughs> essentially. Um, it's a lot like dating in a way. You have to actually see what players that your personality meshes best with, um, it taught me a, a tremendous amount of how to read someone like with nonverbal cues because a lot of the players were not speaking outwardly and verbalizing what they needed, what they wanted. And so I had to like be this master of reading body language to determine like, oh, this is actually a perfect time to actually hand him a water bottle or a perfect time to tell a joke. I, I became pretty much a master, if you will, at, at like learning when not to speak. And I think there's a real art in that. And maybe there's not, maybe not even listening, you know, just actually the act of just allowing things to remain in silence. How does someone cultivate that? Cause I hear that and that sounds amazing. I'm like, that seems like a really good trait to have probably in any genre. How did you cultivate that? Was it intuitive to you? Was it innate to you? Was it from not wanting to lose your job, so having to learn how to do things to help your player? Yeah, how does fear, 
fear can be a driving force you know <laughs> nothing's guaranteed on the pga tour like each each time you loop you're like i hope there's another one after this um you know and your uh your livelihood depends predominantly on the performance of that golfer and how they play you know for that round or maybe for that tournament um and it is essentially week to week there's not a lot of contractual agreements you know up there and if they are they're handshakes and they can be broken very quickly so yes fear can drive that i i will tell you a story that uh i really probably my first one where i realized like whoa these some of these golfers are really sensitive i remember uh, picking a tree out in the distance i was working for jeff overton <clears throat> he's fresh out of college he was at the boise open and he was just he had just won the walker cup and you know he was just high on life and you know playing really really well and you know i i just picked a tree in the distance and i was and i was like just right of that tree is perfect and he proceeds to hit this banana slice that just like disappears off the face of the earth and just goes way ob comes back to the bag and he's like there's your right don't ever tell me right and i was like what i said right of the tree not right of the planet but i mean so you just have to realize like i got yelled at for that and he gave me a lot of guff for something i thought was a pretty like decent way so here's me on the next tall next hole and i'm so fearful when he says where do i go i'm like <laughs> hands are shaking you know i was like uh i i point to this tree in the distance i like see that see that pine tree in the, in the distance my voice is like cracking he's like yeah and i was like just just to the outside of that and i start signaling just this like little wave of to the right side of that tree you know just to the outside of that tree is perfect so i had to learn actually how to um control my language control my emotions um not be reactive and more responsible to what was happening internally for that player versus what was happening for me so it really was a co-regulation honestly just really like picking up on those subtle cues it, it allowed me to be so sensitive to every little thing the golfer was doing that i could then pick up on that and read that and help like be a facilitator for what that golfer needed in that moment so it came out of a lot of trial and error well this sounds really cool because i've never heard actually about this skill set and benefit that the caddy gives to the player, you know, because so many times we just see, you know, the outside and surface level on TV of the clubs and the numbers and the wind and, you know, more of the, the physical things. Mm -hmm. But you're explaining some sort of energetic relationship that's really intimate between you and the player and you being able to almost be like a concierge of his emotions and, and where he's at. And if he's maybe going high, we bring him down. If he's down to bring him up and if he's too serious to lighten him up and you're kind of like this energetic orchestrator to, yeah. to help him, you know, play the best golf he can. I think that's like really cool. Yeah, it, it was cool. And that's exactly what it was. I was an orchestrator. I was like a conductor, you know, like my players like pissed off. I don't have many holes for him to mess up, especially if we're on the back nine. So essentially I'd have a kind of like a little gamut of just trivia questions I could run through that would just pop him out of his own like stuff without me being like, hey, cheer up, you know, like we'll get him. You know, just let, let, he doesn't need a cheerleader all the time. Sometimes it's pull your head out of your ass. But most of the time it's like you need to say something that isn't going to piss him off, you know, especially let, if he's pissed. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Did the players at the time that you were doing this know that you were doing this? Mm -mm. No, th this this is kind of on such a, a deeper level that <laughs> no, there's no way. I mean, I was prepared for everything. I had I had all this. I had like I had pieces of paper and each one. Some were jokes, you know, if I need to lighten the mood. Some were about current events and then some were about like trivia questions. And based on like what that individual is like experiencing, I know where to navigate them, you know, and I know their personality. So sometimes they're like not into sports. So we're not going to cover like, hey, do you see the actually the, the Bills play, you know, last night versus, you know, hey, did you actually know that there's uh, three oceans that touch two continents in the world? Do you have any idea which two continents they are? People are like, oh, or not continents, sorry, countries. And people are like, oh, I don't know. Like, let me try to figure that out. So that was um, something I used a lot of. And in fact, just a little segue, 
because I mean, maybe the listeners actually care about this is Tiger loved trivia, loved it. So I became really like sharp on my trivia questions because every time we played a practice round um, with Tiger, which was a lot because Bub, Bubba and him were friends, I was just hammering him with uh, with trivia and he loved it. He ate that stuff up. An opportunity to get better, an opportunity to improve, whether that was his physical body, his mind, he would just like just jump all over that. So yeah, it was a... Uh, that was a cool little thing that I got to see that. So you learn the different personalities, you know, some they don't care about trivia. They just want to like, they just want to hear something else. You know, tell them jokes or whatever it is. So it sounds like you, you need to know two things from, from, from what I'm hearing, which is one, you need to know your player's game, mm -hmm. you know, like your actual golf game. And mm -hmm. two, it sounds like it really, really helps if you really know who your golfer is, this mm -hmm. hobby interests his personality his tendencies mm -hmm. and to be able to work with both of those as the round goes on mm -hmm. yeah and like almost therapeutic in a way like a therapist you know you're you're kind of maybe probing the right questions to allow them to find this the, the right answers for themselves you know just it's uh it, it's it's probably one of the most <sighs> dynamically like challenging jobs I've ever had because there is no one thing to be good at. It's not like, hey, listen, you're going to be a social media manager, you know, post three times a day. This is the platform. There's no instructions. It's human connection. It's human interaction. And every time you get fired and get rehired by another player, it's a clean slate. It's a whole gamut of other insecurities or what have you, or personality traits, or even like quirkiness that you have to show up for and relate to and take on really and you're shifting the energy yeah. consciously without them even knowing it mm -hmm. yeah and so it sounds like as you're working your way up this ladder you know whether it's learning you know different parts of the body for stretching or for working out or the mental side and the golf game you're building this really well-roundedness of skills between the internal and external and i'm sure that's helping you from player to player and so next up on the list, I think, is how did you get in contact with Bubba Watson and how did that partnership become between you and him come together? Yeah, so um, I, I, I actually think like Bubba like got me fired uh, from uh, a job first. Uh, what I mean by that is I was actually catting for Ryan Moore on the tour. And every time we played a practice round, Bubba would just hammer ryan for having a caddy slash like trainer he's like why you have a trainer you're not fat what do you need to do like he just constantly on ryan for like you don't need him that's that 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 shit doesn't work you know it's just um he was a I, I you know he he just had a huge wall up against any kind of um personal improvement um, probably because he just was curious and he probably knew, knew he needed it for himself so it was a constant like you know, sometimes we badger the things that we know we need, but aren't ready to like hear the message yet. So um, ultimately my relationship with Ryan <laughs> didn't work out. You know, Ryan actually started to play bad and probably was like, I think Bubba's right. But <laughs> ironically enough, <laughs> Bubba hired me after Ryan and I uh, split. I actually thought it was a prank. I, uh, when Bubba first called me, I'm like, yeah, right. Of any of any human being on the planet that would hire me, it would not be Bubba. That'd be the last choice. And he, because he didn't do anything, I mean, related to like fitness or conditioning or anything. He's just an incredible, like, freak athlete. And um, I was just shocked. I thought it was a prank. And ultimately, like, I found out, like, it wasn't a prank. Um, I actually called a few people and was like, hey, is he really actually looking for someone? Now, Bubba didn't ask me to be his caddy. Most of the times I was actually doing like uh, this like personal performance um, and also caddying at the same time. So my job, my days were very full, you know, sun up to late into the night because I was still doing massage therapy, stretching, training outside the ropes. I was caddying inside the ropes. I mean, doing nutrition right before um, some kind of like uh, muscle activation prior to the round. I mean, my life was not my own by any means. Uh, it's zero sovereignty. But I poured everything I had into my players. And I think that's the real way to elicit change. If you want to make a change in something, it's going to have to be all in. 
there's no have four or five irons in the fire. Um, you have to go all in on things. And so once I realized Bubba was serious about actually having a trainer, not a caddy, he just offered me the training position. Um, <laughs> he basically said, hey, I'm going to hire you for five weeks. They're probably going to fire you. But it'll give you five more weeks to find another job on the tour. <laughs> I'm like, nothing like pressure going into it. But I will tell you this. From my previous experience, I noticed when I started making a lot of physical changes with my players, working out, a little soreness kind of crept up. They played like dog shit for like the first like six, five, six weeks. And so knowing that and seeing that, I was like, hey, Bubba, you're going to play terrible for the first six weeks. Then you're going to play great. So I bought myself some time with that. And uh, ultimately, he ended up <laughs> saying, you know, after five weeks, hey, I think I got to let you go. And I actually stood up and said, no, one more week. You only have one more week left in the regular season. Might as well just ride it through. And he agreed to that. And he came in like fifth. And uh, that was the start of a five-year relationship. That's a hilarious story, first of all. Two, were you able to see Bubba's talent in, the, in, in, in those days when you first started to meet with him? Did you see the potential of where he was going what, and what he was destined to become? Yeah. I think I think if there's anything I have a, a good ability, for, like an eye, you know, someone's got a great eye for like brand curation or they can see something. You know, I'm really good at like seeing where someone actually can can improve. It's not a necessarily like doing anything different. It's just putting different things in different structural orders so they can excel at what they do. Bubba was wearing lots of hats. You know, when you can kind of eliminate certain things and have them only focus on the thing that they're good at, their genius, you really start to see what can pour out of them. And uh, I've been very fortunate to pick up on those small energy fluctuations that have determined like, hey, this person has incredible potential. I would love to like work with them to see where it can become. And I think a lot of my probably successes have come from that ability to pick up on that, support them and push them towards the forefront of that and stay in the back and just watch them uh, just kind of just blossom into the world. You know, I, I've known you for, for, you know, probably around eight years now. Mm. And, you know, one of the first things I realized about you is your self-sacrificing nature to serve somebody else. And, you know, we, we know Mr. Woosley, Dave Woosley, and mm -hmm. just from knowing you and knowing him, it sounds like really working on the tour, working for players, it's a real self-sacrificing job, like a devotion to service, to doing everything in your power to help your player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I, it's very fortunate, actually, Bubba having that tremendous amount of success in the time period that I was with him, you know, going to world number two, winning like master's championships. These things put me in this stratosphere of like wealth. I was around people who had amassed tremendous wealth. They're billionaires. They own incredible like properties around the world and jets and it was really like daunting, but like also an awesome opportunity to see into the window of like, what does this look like? And what is the feeling around all this energy? And like, it just, it just gave me this incredible insight about like, well, if I imagine myself having this type of wealth, what does that feel like? And what is the responsibility around that? I got to be with these people. I got to feel them. I got to be like right there with them. And that like really just, that that gave me exactly what I needed. I was like, ooh, I, you know, I, I know, I know that this isn't necessarily my favorite thing in the world. My favorite thing is actually service. My favorite thing is like showing up for others and like helping them. And does someone need something? Phenomenal. I'd love to kind of uh, do anything I can, whether that's a connection or you know, I'm just always pouring abundance into others. That's that's just my currency. You know, I, I call it touch points, but essentially, you know, the the quality of my life will be measured by how many people I'm able to interact with and how many people I'm able to like smile at and actually truly help. And that help comes from like a wealth of knowledge from travel, 
Um, maybe it's financial sometimes. Maybe it's a wealth of advice. You know, I think maybe it's just listening. I think as I've gotten older, I've realized that like even listening is one of the greatest gifts you can give to someone to witness them, to witness them and, and who they are. These are the kind of the currencies in which I measure my life. And um, I think it was really important for me to be in those energies, to see what I didn't want, to know exactly what I wanted and to know how I wanted to spend the rest of my life. Wow, that's that's a lot to digest right there, Fish. That's beautiful. Yeah. What was, if you could say, you know, what how you grew the most being on the PG tour? How about this? I'll make it a little bit more specific. How did Bubba help you to grow the most? And what was the hardest thing? working with Bubba. So what was the hardest thing working with Bubba and how did you grow the most from working with Bubba? I think those are correlated. I think the hardest things in within that dynamic were the ones that grew me the most. You know, I had to find um, an outlet because, you know, I'm a human being too. I have feelings and emotions and, you know, I'm stressed and I feel that. I feel his stress. And so, honestly, you know, <clears throat> people who are incredible visionaries often are not great at structural leadership. It can happen. There can be overlaps, but, but most of the time, that's not the way it goes. There's someone who can like implement and do a great job at leading from within. And there's someone who can actually have the bigger vision and like see where it needs to go. And someone like Baba, he's just a, he's just a genius in his own right, but he needs someone to support that genius. And that is not an easy task. That, that, that seeing someone in all of them, like all their messiness. And so it's being, um, it's being in the shadows and whether or not you're comfortable with that. I had to live in those shadows and, you know, kind of like a, Hey, I'm not telling anybody I have a trainer. I don't want that to be part of my mantra. I want to kind of be like a self-taught grip it and rip it. I don't really care. I just kind of show up and play golf. I don't want people to know I like work my ass off in the gym. You know, so there's an aspect of like, I kind of have to hide you. And so that's what I mean by like in the shadows, like, you know, you, you're not going to get any praise. You're not going to get any like good jobs, you know, so are, can you find that within yourself? Can you find like, can you actually become your greatest cheerleader? And I would imagine that in the lack of that, um, or in maybe in his inability to lead um, me and to, to encourage praise within me, I had to then turn in turn, find it within myself. So I know that's a very deep answer, but ultimately times that we're deprived something like we're going to have to find it within ourselves. And so for me, some of the hardest things was not receiving any type of accolade or gratitude or praise and then having to then, go inward and like go deep inward to my own self and find it. Cause it just lurked in the dark. That sounds like a real, like spiritual, soulful growing practice. That's, I mean, that's, that's life. And Bubba is, I mean, he's one of the most talented golfers of our time. And just to talk a little golf with you, cause that was really deep and beautiful. And I love it. How good is Bubba as a golfer? Just as a golfer, you know, you, you're on the range with Tiger and Ricky and everybody like just as a golfer, how talented and amazing is this guy in your opinion? I know a lot of golfers and I've interacted with a ton within my tenure tenure. Now I didn't see some of the guys like Jack back in the day. So it's with a grain of salt, but I actually think I think that actually Bubba Watson is the greatest golfer that's ever lived. And I don't say that lightly. I, I have watched just thousands of golfers hit golf balls and I've watched their capabilities and what they can do. Now, let me clarify, most talented golfer that's ever lived, like he can do anything. He can hit any shot. Like there's a reason Tiger would hang around Bubba. It was like, what does this guy have that I don't? 
what can I learn from him? You know, Tiger didn't just hang out with him because he wanted to. He wanted to learn. Um, Bob Boba was given a gift that I don't think I've ever seen the likes of. Now, does that correlate to him winning every single tournament? No. There's a multitude of factors that happen to win golf tournaments, you know? And there's a lot of golfers that are a lot more mentally strong. And it comes down to that a lot of times, especially when pressure is on the line. Talent alone isn't enough to just win championships. But I do actually stand by that. You know, he he can hit shots that no one in the world can even possibly fathom. I've watched him hit three irons just five feet off the ground. I've watched him then take that three iron to the moon higher than wedges. You know, I've watched him take a wedge and do the exact same thing. I've watched him curve balls like, like it was a Frisbee. I mean, that shot at the Masters, that's common. I watch him hit that shot like pff, daily, multiple times, just in the rounds that we just play together off the course just for fun. To do it when pressure was on the line, that's where it was really special. And that's where he was able to shine. I think that came from a lot of the hard work that he did in the gym. It was the first time that he probably went through something really hard and kind of came out the other side. Like some of those training sessions, they're not enjoyable. They're not fun. You have to push through areas of pain and discomfort. And so too on that, you know, allowed him to be, to find growth. And I think like, I think a big correlation of that um, was his ability to, to get strong more more confidence and more mentally like ready to hit shots like that, to believe that he actually had put hard work in and that he now deserves to be on the PGA tour is a real big mental arbitrage. And most golfers could do well to listen to that and use that to their advantage. I heard once Jack Nicholas say something like he would go to the major champion sites earlier than anybody and get the most practice rounds in. Mm -hmm. and and I believe on this interview, I heard him say that he did that because he felt if he went there earlier, got the most practice rounds and spent the most time preparing, that then that gave him the feeling that he deserved to win more than everybody else. He's like, I put in more time. I prepared more. You know, I'm doing more. I feel like I deserve to win this now. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for obviously with Bubba's talent and that him not needing to grind like um, a Ben Crane or a Zach Johnson, you know. He, he needed to balance that with something else. He's like, Hey, I do work as hard as these guys, you know, in the way that I need to, to feel like I can be and compete with the best of the best. That's right. Now, we do know Bubba definitely didn't have a swing coach. That'd be crazy. If you came out and he was like, he had six swing coaches, you know, work with them. You know, that'd be funny. No, we know that. But with that yeah. being said, you know, you're on the tour, you're with the greatest athletes, the greatest tournaments. And that also means you're with the greatest coaches. Yeah. So can you share about, let's say, who's the most impressive coach to you that you've seen, that you spent time with, and why? <sighs> Gosh. It's so it's so hard because it just depends on what I think is is greatness, you know? Like I mean, probably the best coaches actually probably aren't on the PGA tour, to be honest. Um, but I was only um I only had that small pool of people because think about that lifestyle. Think about being on tour. Like you, you're going to have to take a sacrifice. You're going to have to be good at travel. You're going to have to be adaptable. There's a lot of people that love their own patterns, love their own habits. They don't want to pick up and go for a tour player. And maybe they don't even want to hear the lip from a tour player and the complaints. You know, I think probably if I have to throw a name out there and, and that's just because I have a personal relationship and I, and I really enjoyed him was, was Sean Foley because I don't think he was just a good golf coach. I think he was great at like being like Mr. Politics. I would watch him come into a room and he would sit and he would tell like a little like insightful thing. Something like, hey, do you think like hydration or prehydration is important? Animals don't prehydrate. They just drink when they're thirsty. What are your thoughts on that? Or maybe, you know what? Just contemplate a little bit. I'll be back. And then he would leave the table and he would go to the next. And he found himself like just to watch him walk, work a room, like maybe in this particular case, a player dining hall and to go to each player. The touch points on this guy were insane. And from there, he was great at remembering names. I never had an introduction to him and he'd be like, hey, fish. And I'm like, how do you know my name? PGA Tour um, 
is is made up and and comprised of a multitude of clicks. Like if you're in like the VJ Singh camp, you don't really mingle with the Tiger Woods camp, and they don't really remember like mingle over here with like maybe you know the Jordan Spieth camp or what have you. Whoever the top players are, you know, especially the guys with like Jets, like Ernie Els and stuff, they stay in their own energy with their own people. They hardly ever kind of mix. And that's so different from like the nationwide tour where guys like room together, they shared, there was intimacies, there was just like it was camaraderie. It was in a way a lot more enjoyable. But I think that Sean Foley stands out for a multitude of different reasons because I think that there's way more than um just actually understanding the swing to golf coaches. Like understanding the psychology, learning like when to say something, when not to. And really we deem this, and it's not going to be a golf term. It's more like actually in the spiritual like healing world, but it's um it's holding space. And what holding space essentially means is it's to make space in the outside world so that the person that you're with right there and then can actually create space. They can actually expand and become bigger than themselves. But you have to like keep people off. You have to keep them away because it's very draining to have a multitude of people coming into your space. It's very energetically that exchange between thousands of people like fame is not easy. It is very difficult. Every time you're about to eat, Oh, can I get a picture? I mean, just your life is not your own. And so golf instruction um, is far more about than is far more than just about the actual instruction. It, it, it plays heavily on your ability to understand human nature and to study and to study humans, which Sean does a, a great job at, at doing. You're just dropping a lot of nuggets into my head that I didn't know. Hmm. Well, 10 years, you know. It's beautiful, you know, because I'm thinking it's all about the instruction. I'm thinking it's about the, the elbow and the degrees and the angle of attack and the, the launch angle. So no, you made a lot of those in instructors are actually there to hold space. They're there for some, like you want to do it alone in life. I doubt it. They're there to actually be there with you so that you can have someone to celebrate it with. So there can be that hard work, much like, you know, mm-hmm. You're almost, you're almost creating something you can work hard at so they can deserve it. Jack may gets maybe gets there early to the golf course. Maybe your golf instructor is the reason that you put those hours in and grind on the range, and that's your confidence booster because this is a game that's predicated on your confidence. And so, you know, I believe that golf instructors mul- are, are, are majority like a tool that are used to actually create confidence for the for the golf for the golf player to show up in the best that they can you mentioned that that maybe perhaps the greatest instructors in the world aren't on the tour yeah so what what separates an instructor from an instructor who wants to get onto a high level tour pg tour and one that doesn't do they have does the one that ha- get to the pg tour does he have to sacrifice his family life more does he does he does he want like what, what is it that would draw maybe an instructor to want to be at that level versus, you know, making a good living at their local range, supporting, you know, juniors, adults, seniors, you know, what, what is it about the, the Foley archetype? That's like, Hey, I want to be a PGA tour coach. And, and, and I'm sure that in some regards, like you're saying, has a lot of hardships and trials and difficulties that you wouldn't necessarily think um, that you wouldn't get at your local range. Yeah. I mean, you're dealing with lots of different answers here. I mean, validation is a big part of it. You know, it's like, I want to be seen and known as one of the greats, one of the best, one of the top, you know, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you're the greatest golf instructor. Like David Ledbetter essentially can be like a great marketer or have a great marketing team around him. In fact, I actually kind of know some of the people who are his agents. They got great deals, great contracts. They levied like incredible sponsorship deals. So you see him all over the place, you know, and he's, he appears in these golf digests and stuff. That doesn't mean his information is, you know, the best. It just means that he's a great marketer. And I think, and I don't remember what book this was, probably Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, when a woman who was actually like a really like well-studied journalist came up to him 
and said, hey, you've wrote this incredible Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It gets all these accolades and you're a best-selling author. How can I become a best-selling author? And his advice to her was to become a marketer, to learn how to market yourself. And she thought that was very beneath her. She's like, I went to this very like prestigious college. You think I'm going to go to marketing school? I don't think so. And he was like, well, it's best-selling author. It's not best writing author. And so too, that is probably the case with golf instructors. You know, those are just some of the most, the best marketed. Those are the ones that you're aware of. And I think probably golf influencer knows that. Well, that's cool. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing you saying, you know, if I'm a golf instructor and I'm listening to you, I hear I can become the best instructor I can be or one of the best in the world. And that doesn't mean I need to be on the PGA Tour to showcase that. Nope. In fact, probably um, it's to behoove you to not have to travel all the time. Like a lot of the golf instructors on the tour, they don't have a lot of time to allocate towards creating content for an audience. In fact, you don't really know much about these golf instructors that are on the tour, really. A majority of them walk up to their player and whisper something in their ear. It's very secretive. It's a very like... Hey, you're not privy to this information. You don't get to hear golf golfers. You don't even get to hear golfers speak when they're hitting and being out on the golf course. Like every other like arena, Mac mics up their players. Like I hear the NFL players. I hear them all golf instructors. Mm -mm. I've seen them mic'd up before, but it's like watching paint dry. They don't say anything that's of interest. Now I'll tell you when they're unmiked, they say a lot of interesting things. <laughs> But when they're mic'd up, mm -mm, not going to happen. Um, they got a brand to protect. You know, they might get in trouble for saying a word. You know, Justin Thomas has had kind of come across that a little bit. You know, it's like you got to watch what you say. And so I think that there's an aspect of like on a place in a platform like YouTube for specifically, you can say whatever you want. You can authentically be who you want. You're not like limited by all of this like tradition, if you will. And so I think you can really step into it. I think I saw you doing a golf vlog and you were speaking to the camera and also walking us through the shot. And I know that's led to like people like Garrett for GM golf and you know, the good, good brand and things like that. But you were really the adopter of that. I saw you do that on YouTube and I was like, wow, there's actual connection between what you're saying and how you're saying it and how you're delivering it. And you're using YouTube as the platform. That's how I found you. I found you on YouTube and I saw you doing something that I really valued and I thought would be the next wave in golf instruction. That's a perfect segue into, into the next segment, you know, cause you have 10 years on the PGA tour. I know we're just literally cracking the tip of the iceberg. I have heard you tell me stories with about tiger and Ryder cups and, you know, all types of amazing, interesting stories that people would love to hear but where we have a limited amount of time. So it, it, when you found me on YouTube, was that in response to, you know, working with Bubba being behind the scenes and you having now this wealth of knowledge, this wealth of experience, these wealth of stories that you can use to help people. And then when you saw me, this was this outlet to finally be able to share um, and provide service with everything you've gained on with your 10 years on the PGA tour. Yeah, it's perfectly said. You know, YouTube, I was like, oh, an outlet that's not me writing a book, a, the secrets of so-and-so. You know, I, that's not my personality to like go ahead and like divulge all that information in like a, you know, who tells all book. You know, these were my stories. You know, these were my sacrifices and I earned those. And those should be shared with discernment, not just a, a tell-all book to make some money. YouTube would give me an opportunity to share those stories, how I felt they needed to be shared and with the tact that I needed to speak with them on. And so when I left the PGA tour, there's no need to like kind of create friendships or, you know, anything like that. There's nothing, there's nothing to lose anymore, but I still wanted to do it in an artistic and tasteful way. And I saw you and I was like, boom, you became my Royce Nielsen for the next evolution. I saw someone who was doing something I wanted to do and I moved towards that. Thank you. You know, um, I, I stumbled upon YouTube as a, as a trick shot video in 2009. 
and then started making golf course vlogs, you know, and then wanting to share my journey of improvement, which was like, I'm like, hey, I just want to get as good as I can get. And then the name movement towards improvement came to me. And, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, but it is so awesome that YouTube gives you this ability to create something from your own genuine, authentic soul expression. What's up, YouTube? This is Gibber Wetter here representing the movement towards improvement, MT. I know that just like, but I bang, bang. You know what it is. And then I was able to create these videos. And my only two goals were this, to be genuine yeah. and to create value. And the movement towards improvement was brainwashing me every day. Every day I would wake up thinking of a video to make that was about improving, that was about providing value. And it was like creating a better version of myself through this brand and through my viewers who are grateful for the content, grateful for the coaches, grateful for the pros, grateful for the top ranked junior golfers. And they're like, Gabe, thank you for making this content. This is amazing. This is helping my game it's helping inspire me and it was just pulling me along and that's where golf influencer comes in now which is the same thing it's a movement that inspires others to be of service to take the responsibility to lead and be of service so you found me we end up building a, a relationship you know because of the because of the character that you've built on the PG tour, you really impressed me with who you are and what you had done. And so we started making YouTube videos together. Mm -hmm. And then I came to this conclusion at some point that I was like, you know what, fish, I just don't feel like golf instruction is really for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm like succeeding. I'm doing real, really well. YouTube channels doing great. I had a golf membership site at the time. It was doing great clothing deal doing great working at a really nice um academy in phoenix and i was just like I, I i don't know what it is but i don't feel like i want to be a golf instructor for the rest of my life mm -hmm. and so i made the decision to leave and after our, we after i after i left you and i had been discussing before about creating a new golf membership site with the new up and coming golf teachers mm -hmm. yeah I at remember. the time there was a website called Revolution, Revolution Golf. Golf. Yeah, at the time, yep. And it was run by a man named Justin Tupper. Justin. Yep, that's right. And it had, you know, Martin Chuck and all these top level golf instructors on it. And right. for me having my YouTube channel, for me having my own membership site, we were going to get the new younger generation of instructors because most of them are a little bit older. Yeah. And we were talking to Andy Pat now, I remember at the time, mm -hmm. and I had just got a lesson from George just some months earlier because my coach was in Hawaii, Kelvin Miyahira mm. and George was teaching very similar things to my coach, but obviously to go to Hawaii is not easy. So I'm like, Hey, George is in LA. I'm in San Diego. It's two hours away. Right. I found George on Instagram. I hate hey, George. Can I get a lesson? I get a lesson from him and he's like wearing flip flops. He's got a shirt untucked. He might be chewing tobacco, Yeah. but I could really see the wealth of knowledge that, George had about the swing that I really agreed with and a very strong passion for helping golfers. So we reached out to George and we're like, Hey George, we'd like to build you a membership site. That's right. And I don't remember the exact response George gave us seven years ago, but it was something like, cool, let's, let's do it. Like, let's see what happens. I don't know. More along the lines of if you, if you want to waste your time, go right ahead. <laughs> Yeah, because, oh, okay. because he's like, no one's gonna watch me. I don't know. Why would anyone care what I have to say? That's actually what he said. Well, thank you for for reminding me because George maybe had ten thousand Instagram followers at the time. A little less, but yeah. And you know, and, and I just believed in once again his passion, his wealth of knowledge. So we we filmed the membership site. We launched the membership site and YouTube channel together, I believe. And I remember telling you, I'm like, fish. I don't know if this is going to work, you know, like I have 500 plus YouTube videos, 40,000 subscribers, millions of views. My membership site's doing good. Cause I just constantly put out valuable content. People know yeah. about me, I build right. a relationship with people. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but if I had to guess, I think it will, but I just don't know. Cause I've never done it. Mm -hmm. And so we launched it 
I paid my dad mm-hmm. internet marketing runs in my family. I paid my dad $5,000 for like an opt-in page, a sales page, an email sequence to set it all up. You and I are down there in the trenches in the rain, filming George, filming for the membership site, filming yeah. for the YouTube channel. And we launched and it did about, I want to say, to, correct me if, I write, if, I'm, if I'm right here, it did like 45,000 in its launch. Yeah, that's about right. Yep. 40. So it was like, I want to say it was like around 300 people. And we, we did like maybe a, a lifetime deal at like $150. And Close. it came out, it came out to around 45. So I'm like, Hey, I'm stepping away from golf. I'm like, I don't feel like this is what I want to do. I leave after the first month that we launched the membership site and YouTube channel. And I go to Peru <laughs> where I actually, I currently live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and you ended up taking this membership site with George and doing over, I believe, three hundred thousand dollars its first year. A bit more than that, but yep. Okay, and it's gone on to do you know well over seven figures. I mean, none of us, me, you, or George, had zero clue of what this was going to turn into let alone be successful, let alone go to the heights that it did. Can you just walk us through that, that journey and why you think it worked and just it's success? Yeah. So two, two things that stand out. The first is that George is iconic in his like uniqueness and his expression. And that's not really like, you don't see that too often in golf. You don't see that personality stand out. I remember a lot of people being like, I'm turning this off. He's wearing flip flops. He should be wearing golf shoes. I'm like, golf instructors teaching in golf shoes. That sounds extremely uncomfortable. They stand all day. But, you know, there's a certain um, thought process that goes with how golf should look and how it should be taught. And George defied a lot of those things. Um, I had met George uh, prior to all of this um, years ago, prior on the range at Westlake with Bubba. Um, and he, he stood out then I'm like, what is he wearing? You know, like it made me second glance in a, in a world of people scrolling, you know, it was a thumb stopper, if you will, in real life, wearing like board shorts and, you know, uh, slides and tobacco and a flat brim hat that's turned off to the side. And, you know, and he wasn't a young guy, but dressed like, you know, SoCal, you know, young kid, but had knowledge, had, um, an understanding of the golf swing that I found to be like very useful and practical. And it was really just, um, you know, you've got a personality that can be really shown on YouTube if captured. And if you look at YouTube at the time, every single golf instructor in the world was just like telling you tips. And then it was like, Hey, the call to action is buy my membership that actually has more tips. And I just thought, God, what a horrible way. Like telling people to like, here's tips to sell tips. Like, but that was the traditional model. You know, it's like rotary swing, top speed golf, <clears throat> you know, it's just, um, I looked at those and I was like, ah, I just don't like it. You know, and Gary V was very adamant about, you know, uh, cre- creation or documentation of, of content over creation of content. And so I thought about that. I was like, you know what, actually, that's a great, great point. Who's documenting their lessons? Who's actually like filming these lessons live and putting it out the highlights for people to watch? I mean, that's going to validate that this coach knows what he's talking about, or it's going to repel who's not interested in who and what type of instruction he's dispensing. So there's an opportunity right there. So you've got a a unique individual who can stand out and be in his full expression and doesn't have to like fall under the models of a golf digest or the PGA tour or any of these other like, you know, organizations that like, you know, they're just don't have, they're not inclusive. And so, you know, here's George on a platform that is for everyone. And so just like, it took a while though to get that moving. A lot of people just right in the beginning, who cares? This is boring, paint dry, blah, blah, blah. And eventually though, people started listening and be like, actually, you know what? Actually, he's saying some good things here. Just ignore what he looks like and just focus on what he's saying. And then it became like, wow, now it's a cool thing. And the adoption curve, like we always see, started to get bigger and bigger. And then it became a common stance to accept George Gankus as like, you know, a new and upcoming 
um, out of nowhere type of uh, golf instructor. Yet on the back end, you got to remember, I'm like calling every single kind of like person I can and using all of my contacts for podcasts and like golf channel and all these connections I've created and curated over 10 years. I'm able to now actually cash in on those favors and get George a lot of exposure very quickly. And the, vir the virality of actually social media and in this particular case, um, um, YouTube just spoke for itself. It was long form content that people really like got behind. Even when I decided to run ads, all that I did was run an actual ad of him teaching. Because if you can actually show people what you're buying into, then there's actually a real adoption. There's a real movement. It's not just a facade of like fake bots and, and, and purchases and likes. It's really actually people that are like, no, I really like what this guy has to say. As a, as a golf instructor. And then from there, it moved into his like, you know, his iconicness. And he's become one of the top golf instructors um, probably of this, at least this half decade. I want all the golf instructors that are listening to really, to really tune in right now because there's a lot of wisdom and opportunity we can share through these experiences working with George and in helping him grow his brand, you know, helping grow his instruction, um, helping him growing his income. And I think it's something we stumbled upon that we became conscious of after the fact, you know, and actually when I was selling my membership site, the months that we had created the most money were the months where I was in Hawaii and I was recording the lessons with myself, with Gordon, with Blair. So people were seeing Kelvin work with Blair and the changes he was taking making and then the transformations in the ball flight and the distance, et cetera. Yeah. And then with George, we just kind of stumbled upon it because you have to understand at, at this time, you know, you and I have talked about kind of like these golf coach YouTubers and golf coaches. Yeah. George is teaching 10 hours a day. Right. And, and, and our, and our, and our last client, um, golf influencers, last client, poor that golf, they're, they're teaching like 10, 12 hours a day. First of all, they're teaching from seven to seven for, for while the sun's out. And then I'm watching these guys answer text messages, answer DMS, review and swings when they go home for two or three hours. Yep. These are golf coaches, like That's right. real deal. They're not, they don't got a camera out there. They're not working on an intro or an outro. They're teaching golf all day, every day. Yeah. And so right. George, these guys can't do an intro. They can't do what I do, but they can fucking teach golf phenomenally. So mm -hmm. we're like, okay, George, let's just film your lessons. It's unlimited content, right? Mm -hmm. And that was something that was new at the time. And I still think it's fairly new. Like a lot of coaches don't film their lessons with their students. And I think one of the greatest pieces of, it, of wisdom that we can share through what we've done and what's worked and still what most people don't do is record your lessons. It, it showcases who you are showcases what you do, how you do it, and the transformations that you get with your students that I believe and I think the world agrees with is far more impactful than you just telling us what to do by yourself. Yep. Yeah, it's a confidence issue. You know, do you have enough confidence in who you are to actually use your voice? You know, that, that comes in every kind of topic that you can ever imagine, you know, like, Someone doesn't want to speak on stage, you know, in front of their peers because, ooh, you know, judgment. You know, are you able to put your stuff out there and reap the benefits of social media judgment? Because a multitude of comments came in that were like, you suck, your shoes, you need, you know, <laughs> don't touch those kids. <laughs> I mean, you name it, a multitude of things came out. But you know what? A lot of beauty came out of it too because he was able to then specifically like target who loved him and the people he repelled, he repelled. You have to be okay with that. The world, like I'll do one thing and literally there are two sides to the story. You know, oh my goodness, that's amazing. That is witchcraft. You know, people have like these two, I mean, we live on a polar planet with poles. There's going to be polarity. That's where it is. So, you know, really kind of owning who you are and having the confidence to use your voice as a golf instructor, you know, that can be a scary thing. But if you have the courage to do it, you step out there, you will attract the people that resonate with you. I promise you. If there's so many people that want help. I mean, George had an influx of DMs and just 
emails from like sultans on the other side of the world. Like guys would send and share a video because he spoke about Adam Scott and his like posture. A year later, he's working with Adam Scott. It shows the caliber of, you know, just how, how important, it just shows the importance of actually being and putting yourself out there and what that can lead to. Because what you're really doing, as you mentioned before, is you're showing your journey. You're showing your skill and you're documenting it. And that is in, in turn sharing your journey with others. Well, this goes back to, you know, we could talk about what makes a caddy great and a coach great. And we could think of all the things, these things on the surface level. In, in our company, we help golf instructors, you know, get launched on YouTube and, and we do their titles, you know, for, for George and our last client, Poor Zach Golf, who's now doing over a million views a month on YouTube. We do their titles. We do their descriptions. We do their tags. We do their thumbnails, their end cards, their inter interactive cards, their playlists, all these things to to optimize and do the tactical things correct. But there's this internal essence of, of George or poor Zach that they get rewarded from because they were willing to put themselves out there and share. Share more than other people are sharing and that creates more value that separates them from everybody else. And that's why they're reaping the rewards of poor Zach's full swing masterclass of George's membership site of their YouTube channels and the way that I got over this, because I used to make videos of like how to work out in the pro shop and like how to hit a golf ball out of water. And I was wearing like snorkel gear and a trash bag. And I would yeah. do like these crazy goofy things. And my intros were out of control. I mean, I can't watch 90% of my videos from the past because it's just cringe. You know, it's just cringy. It's hard for me to watch. But once again, it came down to, to providing value and being myself. So it's like, if I got some negative comments, if people were, you know, maybe negatively commenting on George, it's like, Hey, if this is who I am and I'm trying to provide value. Then it's like my, if my intention is correct, then it's like my conscious is clean. My conscious mm -hmm. is clean. Like I, that's your stuff because I'm genuinely trying to help. And obviously if we're putting out all these lessons of George, all these lessons of poor Zach, yeah, maybe some people don't resonate with, with George and but people aren't going to resonate with me. I'm very loud. I'm very outspoken. I'm very expressive. And that's okay. Cause I'm not here to help everybody. I can't help every golf instructor, No, but I can help a few golf instructors. I can help some golf instructors like Gabe. Fuck. He's got the, I, I want to create a movement, you know, like mm -hmm. I want to take the responsibility to lead and be of service, transform more lives. And then my life's transformed and then I influence golf for the better. Mm -hmm. I need someone who lines up with my mission and then you're not going to actually find the right matches for you. If you're not hundred percent authentically yourself, then you're in the lukewarm area of trying to please everybody. And then you don't actually get the people you actually want who can actually really utilize what you do, get the most results. And then both lives are both increased exponentially because of that. Yeah, I can only agree with it. hundred percent. But it takes someone to actually help you. You can't do it on your own. If you try, you will fail. I have, well, uh, I've been Go a, ahead. I've owned over 20 businesses in my life. And the ones that were by myself, I actually had no chance, not even close uh, ability to have success. And honestly, I didn't want it. Who wants to have a, a business that's actually by yourself? You want people helping you. You want to be able to share that journey with others. That's what makes it really, really special. And so there's just something to be said about like being okay with asking for help and knowing that other people do things way better than you. Well, we're just plugging the golf influencer service right now. I got a ticker at the bottom for a free ebook. I see that. Fish. <laughs> Well, this goes, back to the PGA, this goes back to the PJ tour and a player having a caddy, a personal trainer, oh. uh, a mental coach, maybe a statistician, maybe, yep. maybe even his wife can be support. So it's like, we all need teams. I need a team to help me with the logo, with the brand book, with the opt-in page, with the YouTube branding bundle, with the editing and the YouTube optimization. And the realization I had when I was thinking about, you know, 
what we started with George, what you did, what we've been doing for what we did for poor Zach, and, and he's been doing phenomenal. I'm like, what did, how is this happening? How are we, how are we helping these people so much growing their influence impact? Like, how is it? And then I realized we built them a team. We built them a team of experts on our side that do great at what we do and which allows them to do great at what we do. But I'm like, that's it. It's, it's not like the information or the awareness. It's like, we built them a team, which is like, we do everything for you and for them. And just like I have a team and I learn from, from my marketers and from my coaches. And did you want to say something? Yeah. I mean, there's just a massive team for um, George, you know, behind the scenes. No, no one knows that. You know, most of people will think like, oh, George, how, how did you just do it? How did you, how did you, how were you here, 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 and here? Yeah, well, uh, a team of actually, through the entire duration of his brand, a team of 25 people. That's how, you know, but in, but incrementally they were in place, you know, five people at a time and uh, along that journey. So you need uh, people to help you and, and, and you want, and you want that, you know, you want that. And you want to have people who actually do it really well. Yeah, I mean, for me, right, this is going on 13 years of experience, you know, 500 plus of my own videos that anybody can see any time on our channel, Movement Towards Improvement, Golf Influencer, and then hundreds of videos for, for clients, for filming for George, filming for poor Zach, and just have done hundreds of thumbnails and titles of descriptions and tags. And, and my mastery is YouTube. And it's interesting because I mentioned how, you know, I, I realized golf instruction isn't the thing that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And as I've gone on this journey of growing up and maturing, and like we've mentioned earlier, experiencing, experimenting, exploring, I came to this realization of like, I want to be the best of service to the world. And then it became like, how can I help people do what I did? I created the movement towards improvement. I created a YouTube channel. I created a membership site. And, and we we I, I was part of the launching for George. And then I wanted to take it to the next level. And I believe I did that with poor Zach Golf. And it's just something that I think I have a God-given gift to do and something that I've embodied and I've also had 13 plus years of experience in. And that's where Golf Influencer was born of. I'm looking for instructors that want to create movements bigger than themselves, impact millions of golfers and help influence a golf for the better. And I have no problem saying that because this is, this is me. And this is what, this is the only thing I can do. And, and I'm honored to have helped the people that I've helped and I look forward to helping others. Sometimes we don't, uh, we don't even choose what we're good at. It chooses us. And I definitely can speak to that. You know, it's what you've done for so long. Like that is the, that is the realm in which you shine. And to like not do that is a disservice, you know, for Bubba to like quit the game of golf. It's a disservice. I understand sometimes it's hard and it feels like a burden, but sometimes like, like think of like how many lives um, have been changed just by, by like a Ricky Fowler who kind of just dedicates his life to like giving back to others and playing golf and inspiring others, young players to do so. Like we just don't even know, like when we truly step into the things that we're great at, we just completely forget about how many people that's going to inspire. And um, that's really what we're doing. We're, we're here to, to, to like ignite each other's flame and to lift each other up in such a beautiful way. But that comes from like just being open and honest and vulnerable about what you really are good at. And when you find that you speak with vigor and passion about it because it actually moves through you. And uh, I can attest to like, there's no one better on this planet to actually show up for golf instructors. It is what you have done. It's what you've consistently done for such a long time. And it is your genius. Well, thank you. You know, and I, and I go through my own, my own growth, you know, and having to step into new versions of myself and overcome my own insecurities, doubts, worries, fears. I'm just like everybody else. You know, I, I know what people have to go through about putting themselves out there, about actually really owning what they do and how they do it and, and really leading. And, and that, that there's a lot of vulnerability that comes with leadership. And I think you need a lot of humility and good awareness of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if you, like you said, come from the right intention, the right place, 
then the intention for me of service allows me to transcend all those fears, mm-hmm. allows me to transcend all my limitations. So I'm like, hey, I don't know how I look. I don't know how I'm going to sound. I don't know how this is going to succeed. It's like all those fears, anxieties, or limitations are about me or about mm-hmm. you. And it's like, this ain't about you. Life isn't about us. It's about what we can do for each other, for something bigger than ourselves. And golf is bigger than ourselves. So how can we all impact golf in our own unique way that impacts golfers or families or instructors and help keep this game going? Because, you know, this sports aren't guaranteed to stay around forever. Mm. So the more that we can do to really step up and become the best version of ourselves and influence golf is going to also help guarantee that this sports here in a hundred years from now. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can attest to just thousands of emails of people that just felt like you changed their life. You know, to change someone's golf swing is to ultimately change a part of them. Everyone has their unique golf swing. It's so unique. Just like we have our own voice and our own sound and to like really help someone actually voice that sound to bring it to the surface is very similar to actually bringing your golf swing to, to a more concrete place where it's more consistent. And it really gives you these outcomes that you really desire. So to really show up for someone and do that is indirectly an opportunity to change their life. And I can tell you a thousands of emails that have said that, thank you so much for helping, you know, really affect my golf game and giving it in such a beautiful way. Um, they were mostly towards George, but you know, it just like, it's still it's still a bigger part of what we were all a part of. It's really special. What else are we going to do with our time here? If it's not cultivating our skills, mm-hmm. following our passion, and serving others with what we've been gifted with and what we've taken the time to develop and, and grow and become great at, yeah. what else are we going to do? I don't I, I don't know a better alternative. Do you? No. No. doing that is the best thing you can do with your time before it's your time. Okay, fish. Well, I think this is going to wrap up the golf influencer podcast episode numero uno. Mm. Seven years in the making seven years gap, but we came back and, and it's not, it's about the rise back up. It ain't the fall back down. That's right. So, Thank you, Fish. I appreciate you you sharing some insights and some stories about your journey to the PGA Tour and your experience, you know, being around some of the greatest players, being around some of the greatest coaches, you know, and then also, you know, what you've done in the online space and the digital space, really impacting more golfers in a different way, just like you did on tour. And I hope through this podcast is, you know, one of the goals is to encourage other instructors And you don't even need me or our help. I just ultimately want men to create a movement and share their message and their mission and their movement with the world to impact more people because I think the world needs it right now. And I think it's the best thing we can do with our time. And that's what I'm going to live my life for. And I hope other instructors can take inspiration from what we've done for ourselves and what we've done for others. And I hope they go and do the same. There's a lot of great female instructors, male instructors who could really, really use your help. And I think it's going to be really impressive and I will enjoy watching. Fish, is there anywhere people can follow you? If there are some people that are like, Fish, I appreciate the stories. I like who you are. How can I do that? <laughs> well, my, my account is a much different uh, service now to the world. I'm actually the CEO and founder of one of the largest breathwork companies in the world, which is a very important movement. And we'll start to have a lot of notoriety in the next upcoming years. It is breathwork just finds itself at the center point between yoga and meditation. So um, fish Fisher is my handle, uh, just like it is on the screen, F I S H and then F I S C H E R and then an underscore and TikTok, same thing, fish Fisher, YouTube, fish Fisher, you know, it's pretty much across the board. Um, but uh, now I show up for others and it the same way, but it just in a different vehicle, in a different capacity, um, more touch points and just a different, uh, a different circle in a different world. In service to each other for a cause greater than ourselves. Thank you, Fish. Go follow Fish Fisher. Links down below. I also created an ebook that explains in details exactly what we did for George and how we've been con- 
able to continue to improve and what we've done for others. Links down below. Thank you guys. We'll see you on the next episode. Sounds good.